Welcome to Music History Monday for September 18th, 2023. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Jimi Hendrix and the 27 Club. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the death on September 18, 1970, 53 years ago today, of the American guitarist, singer, and songwriter James Marshall Jimi Hendrix at St. Mary Abbott's Hospital in London. He was born in Seattle, Washington on November 27, 1942, making him 27 years old at the time of his death, something we will discuss later in this post. Creating and Mastering a New Idiom Top 10 lists are entirely subjective and thus often irrelevant, but they can be informative when they agree and, as such, indicate a consensus. Here are a few such lists of rock and roll guitarists in which I've cut to the chase and listed only the top four. Rolling Stone Magazine, 100 Greatest Rock Guitarists. At number one, Jimi Hendrix. Number two, Eric Clapton. Number three, Jimmy Page. Number four, Keith Richards. Writing in Rolling Stone, the American guitarist, singer, songwriter, and political activist Tom Morello explains, quote, Jimi Hendrix exploded our idea of what rock music could be. His playing was effortless. There's not one minute of his recorded career that feels like he's working hard at it. It feels like it's all flowing through him. He seamlessly weaves chords and single note runs together and uses chord voicings that don't appear in any music books. His riffs were a pre-metal funk bulldozer and his lead lines were an electric LSD trip down to the crossroads where he pimp-slapped the devil. His legacy is assured as the greatest guitar player of all time." Unquote. Okay, How Stuff Works, the 10 Greatest Rock and Roll Guitarists of All Time. At number one, Jimi Hendrix. Number two, Jimmy Page. Number three, Eric Clapton. Number four, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Writes Jim Halden of How Stuff Works, quote, Despite all the jockeying for position on this list, there was never any question as to who would end up at the top. In his brief life, Jimi Hendrix forever changed the way people thought about the electric guitar. In his hands, it became more than an instrument. It was a gateway into the soul, a vessel through which to communicate the inner workings of a complex man with immeasurable talent." Unquote. Guitar Metrics Top 10 Classic Rock Guitarists. At number one, Jimi Hendrix. Number two, Slash, his real name being Saul Hudson. Number three, Eric Clapton. Number four, Jimmy Page. Writes the editors of Guitar Metrics, quote, The entire landscape of rock music was altered when Jimmy first picked up a guitar. He demonstrated to us how to perform feats that were thought to be impossible on a guitar at the time. The guitar itself started to resemble a part of his body. Unquote. I'll cut to the chase, because with just a couple of exceptions, every greatest rock guitarist list I found during a brief but spirited search on the internet put Hendrix at number one, including Guitarist Next Door, Cleveland.com, Music Industry How To, Roadie Tuner, 
Cultura Sonora, Really Simple Guitar, Louder, Digital Dream Door, Bali Inside, New Arena, Should I Keep Going, The Delight, Music This Day, Rock and Roll Remnants, and Skillshare. Yes, I'll stop now. On those very few lists on which Hendrix wasn't listed at number one, he was listed at number two, behind either Eric Clapton or Jimmy Page. Regarding Jimi Hendrix's place in the pantheon of rock and roll guitarists, that's consensus. Here's another bit of consensus. Almost every one of the lists just indicated put Eric Clapton, born 1945, and Jimmy Page, born 1944, in the top five, along with Jimi Hendrix. What makes these three musicians so very special is not just their extraordinary imaginations and technical wizardry. No, something more is involved here. It's that during the 1960s, they virtually spearheaded the creation of an entirely new instrumental vocabulary, that of the virtuosic solid body electric rock and roll guitar. Let's consider this. The violin family of instruments, the violin, viola, and the cello, were invented in northern Italy in the early 16th century, circa the 1520s. Composers and performers have had 500 years to create a repertoire for these instruments and to progressively develop the technique by which to play them. As opposed to the solid body electric guitar, which was invented in the early 1940s and came into use in the late 1940s. For our information, the first mass produced solid body electric guitars were the Fender Esquire and the Fender Broadcaster, which were first produced in 1950. Whether we credit Leo Fender, born Clarence Leonidas Fender, 1909 to 1991, or Les Paul, born Lester William Polfus, 1915 to 2009, for its invention, well, it's immaterial. By the early 1960s, the solid body electric guitar had become the identifying instrument of rock and roll, a genre of dance music that only acquired its name in 1954. Back to Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page, and Eric Clapton. During the 1960s, they were, to the solid body electric guitar, what Frederick Chopin, Franz Liszt, and Charles Valentin Alkin were in the 1830s to the new metal-harped pianos, those self-made virtuosi who defined what their instrument was capable of. Hendrix, Page, and Clapton were not only the preeminent rock guitarists of their time, but those trailblazing electric guitarists who created a vocabulary and a body of work, a recorded legacy, that allowed other guitarists to learn and grow from them. Having said that, no guitarist came to define the solid body electric guitar better than Jimi Hendrix. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame describes him as, quote, arguably the greatest instrumentalist in the history of rock and roll music, unquote. Pretty impressive for someone whose mainstream career spanned just four years, from 1966 to his death in 1970. James Marshall Jimi Hendrix, 1942 to 1970. Jimi Hendrix was not a guitar virtuoso. He was an electric guitar virtuoso. He did not play what was merely an electronically amplified guitar, but rather an entirely new instrument in an entirely new manner. The electronically enhanced sounds he coaxed, scraped, and swatted from the strings of his Fender Stratocasters defined the instrument entirely. 
Just as importantly, Hendrix was among the very first rock musicians to consider his amplifier as a musical instrument unto itself, an analog synthesizer, if you will, controlled not by a keyboard, but by the strings of his guitar. His use of feedback and distortion, as produced by his amplifier, became an integral part of his sound and style. In these ways and more, Jimi Hendrix was indeed to the electric guitar what Franz Liszt was to the new metal-harped piano, a virtuoso whose software, whose music, defined a new instrumental technology. We'd observe that it was a technology that Hendrix modified for his own needs. A natural lefty, he had no access to left-handed guitars at the time he was learning to play. So he used right-handed guitars, which he restrung and played flipped over or upside down. We will have to save a detailed biographical portrait of Jimi Hendrix for another time. Please allow the following bullet-pointed events to suffice for now with their emphasis on the guitars he played. A sensitive and shy child, he grew up in poverty and claimed as an adult to have been sexually abused, according to Hendrix, quote, by someone in uniform, unquote. As a student at the Horace Mann Elementary School in Seattle, for years he carried around a broomstick which he used to emulate a guitar. We read that he held on to that broomstick cum guitar like a security blanket. In 1957, at the age of 15, he found a ukulele in the garbage his father was removing from an elderly woman's home. Despite the fact that the thing only had one string, Jimmy, who was allowed to keep it, taught himself to play it by ear. In 1958, still at the age of 15, Hendrix bought his first acoustic guitar for $5. He hardly ever put it down and practiced for hour upon hour. In 1959, at 17, he managed to acquire his first electric guitar, a white 1957 Supro Ozark. The Supro Ozark, which was probably borrowed, was soon stolen off a bandstand in Seattle. Hendrix's father, in a rare moment of largesse, bought him a Dan Electro Brahms standard guitar, which became the first electric guitar Jimi Hendrix himself owned. Quote, My first electric guitar was a Dan Electro, which my dad bought for me. It must have busted him, monetarily, for a long time. At the age of 18, Hendrix was caught twice riding in stolen cars. Given the choice by a judge between prison or the army, he chose the army and enlisted on May 31, 1961. Assigned to the legendary 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles, Hendrix trained as a paratrooper, making over 25 parachute jumps. However, he was much more interested in his guitar than army discipline, and he was discharged honorably, on June 29, 1962, after only a year of service. 1962 to 1966, Hendrix pays his dues. Often struggling to make a living wage, he nevertheless slowly climbs the ladder, practicing whenever he's not performing, developing a pretty much unheard of technique. 1964, Hendrix acquires his first Fender Stratocaster, an Olympic white guitar he named Linda after his girlfriend, Linda Kent, who very well might have stolen the guitar from Keith Richards. Despite the fact that Hendrix would occasionally play other Fender guitars, as well as guitars built by Gibson, it was the Stratocaster that was integral to the creation of his personal sound. October 1st, 1966, Hendrix meets Eric Clapton in London 
and asks him if he can sit in on a couple of songs during a performance by Clapton's trio, Cream. Clapton later remembered, quote, He asked if he could play a couple of numbers. I said, of course, but I had a funny feeling about him. He played just about every style you could think of, and not in a flashy way. He walked off, and my life was never the same again." Unquote. 1966, Hendrix forms his own three-person band, the Jimi Hendrix Experience. 1966 to 1970, Hendrix shreds his way to the very top, though his substance abuse, alcohol, amphetamines, cannabis, LSD, cocaine, and heroin grows increasingly problematic. September 18, 1970, Hendrix is pronounced dead at 12.45 p.m. at London's St. Mary Abbott's Hospital. The coroner, one Gavin Thurston, concludes that Hendrix suffocated to death on his own vomit while intoxicated with barbiturates. At the time of his death, Jimi Hendrix was 27 years, 295 days young. The 27 Club curse or myth. Jimi Hendrix is a charter member of the so-called 27 Club, that group of rock and roll and pop musicians who died at the age of 27 of causes unnatural. The 27 Club became part of the public consciousness in 1971, when four top-end rockers died at the age of 27 between 1969 and 1971. Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones, death due to drowning, age 27 years, 125 days. Jimi Hendrix, death from asphyxia due to drug use, age 27 years, 295 days. Janis Joplin, death due to drug overdose, age 27 years, 258 days, and Jim Morrison of The Doors, death likely due to drug overdose, age 27 years, 207 days. Since the founding of the 27 Club, a number of other high-risk lifestyle musicians have, sadly, been admitted to the club, people who died before 1969, and after 1971. For example, before 1969, Louis Chauvin, 1881 to 1908, American ragtime pianist and composer, cause of death, neurosyphilitic sclerosis. His age at the time of his death, 27 years, 13 days. Robert Johnson, 1911 to 1938, American blues musician. Cause of death, likely murder by poisoning. Age, 27 years, 100 days. FYI, my Dr. Bob Prescribes post from May 16th of this year is dedicated to the all-too-brief life and the music of Robert Johnson. Jesse Belvin, 1932 to 1960, rhythm and blues singer, and songwriter and pianist. His best known song is Earth Angel. Cause of death? Car crash. The car's tires had been tampered with, probably by white supremacists. His age at the time of his death was 27 years, 53 days. Rudy Lewis, 1936 to 1964, vocalist with the Drifters. Cause of death? Drug overdose, age 27 years, 271 days. Malcolm Hale, 1941 to 1968, lead singer with Spanky and Our Gang. Cause of death, carbon monoxide poisoning. Age, 27 years, 166 days. And here's a few members of the 27 Club who passed after 1971. Ron Pigpen McKernan, 1945 to 1973, founding member of the Grateful Dead. Cause of death, 
gastrointestinal hemorrhage due to alcoholism. Age, 27 years, 181 days. Kurt Cobain, 1967 to 1994, founder, guitarist, and lead singer of Nirvana. Cause of death, suicide by shotgun. Age, 27 years, 44 days. Amy Winehouse, 1983 to 2011, British singer and songwriter. Cause of death, alcohol poisoning. Age 27 years, 312 days. Ms. Winehouse was a spectacularly gifted musician, potentially the Barbara Streisand of her generation. But tragically, she was as self-destructive as she was talented. I will find an excuse to write about her in the near future. The list of 27 club members goes on. Gratefully, I will not. The question remains, is 27 a cursed age for musicians, or is that just a myth? Alas, I hate to be a fuddy-duddy, <laughs> but a myth it is. A study published in the British Medical Journal in December 2011, quote, concluded that there was no increase in the risk of death for musicians at the age of 27, stating that there were equally small increases at ages 25 and 32. The study noted that young adult musicians have a higher rate of death than the general young adult population, surmising that fame may increase the risk of death among musicians, but this risk is not limited to age 27." Unquote. Another study published in 2014 on the research website The Conversation indicates that statistically popular musicians are most likely to die at the age of 56. So much for the curse of 27. But wait, there is more, because we haven't yet talked about the white lighter myth. The white lighter myth, or white lighter curse, is an add-on to the 27 Club. The white lighter myth claims that certain 27-year-old musicians associated with cannabis intake, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, and Kurt Cobain specifically, all died while in possession of a white, Bic, disposable lighter. Uh, for those of us who must know, Bic is a shortened version of the surname of Marcel Bich, B-I-C-H, one of the founders of the company and the inventor of the Bic disposable lighter. As urban legends go, this one is pretty stupid, right up there with Mama Cass Elliot choking to death on a ham sandwich. She actually died of a heart attack. And Walt Disney having his body frozen after his death. The opposite is true. His body was cremated and his ashes interred at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. In fact, Bick didn't start selling disposable lighters until 1973, after the deaths of Hendrix, Joplin, and Morrison. The only other disposable lighter available at the time, Gillette's Cricket, wasn't sold in the United States until 1972 and was not, at the time, available in white. Yes, you may thank me. Once again, my intrepid scholarship has pierced the bubble of falsehood surrounding yet another urban fairy tale. Thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.